Welcome to the Psych Guys podcast. We have Dr. Pat Cleary here. Um, you win the award for our first attending psychiatrist on the show. So Woo! congratulations. Um, me excited. and Pat uh, met, I don't know, maybe two, a year and a half ago, two years ago yeah, um, at this uh, kind of like networking event. We went golfing together, had a great conversation. So super cool to reconnect with you, have you on here. Um, you're a child and adolescent psychiatrist. Um, I guess, can you... Like in brief, give us a quick outline of like your training and, and what you do right now. Yeah, sure. be happy to. Uh, so, uh, yeah, like I said, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. Uh, I started off uh, as a resident when like you guys were when I was uh, University of Maryland in Shepherd Pratt in Baltimore. Uh, I got to came up to Philadelphia to do my child fellowship at uh, Children's Hospital CHOP. Oh, OK. And uh, then after that, uh, briefly worked in private practice for about a year, uh, somebody else's private practice. Uh, and then I went on to join uh, Center for Family Guidance and Virtua. And there I am the medical director for uh, the Castle program, which is a partial hospitalization for children uh, in Camden and Berlin, uh, New Jersey. And uh, I'm also the chair for uh, Virtua uh, Psychiatry uh, uh, North and South Campuses. Brad, Brad. So I'm always curious when I talk to child and adolescent psychiatrists because I'm still sort of considering that path. Um, you should. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I mean, I have a damn children's you, book, you right? You both should. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, is a, it is a cool, cool field of medicine, of psychiatry. But... How much of your patients are in that child and adolescent demographic? Like, are you still seeing adults at all? And how much? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I do see adults. Uh, the vast majority in my case of my patients are children. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's by nature of the kind of situation I've, I found myself in with being a director for a partial hospitalization program for kids. Uh, but uh, if you were to ask that same question to say an outpatient psychiatrist uh, who has trained in a child and adolescent psychiatry, they would probably tell you it's a much bigger proportion of uh, adult patients that they're seeing. Um, and some can be a little bit more choosy than others, depending on the region that they're working in or, uh, you know, just a variety of other factors. But um, so some of our psychiatrists that work for the other company, I work for Center for Family Guidance, they um, uh, they will probably have a mix of like if their child and adolescent change like 50, 50 percent. Oh, wow. In my oh. case, the only time I really work with adults is when I'm covering for a colleague uh, mm -hmm. who uh, works with adults, uh, whether I'm vacation or when I'm on call on the weekend and uh, working in one of the hospital systems at the inpatient psychiatric units or on a consult service. Well, cool, cool. So we want to kind of talk about two main um, focuses today, ADHD and kind of social media and how that interfaces with each other. June, I'll, I'll let you kind of kick us off here. Yeah, Pat. Um, you know, when I think about the pediatric population and granted where we just finished up our second year of residency, so our sure. child and adolescence experience is kind of limited, right? I've, I've taken care of kids in the inpatient unit, but never um, in a hosp partial hospitalization program or in an out outpatient setting. Um, but even in the setting that I have had the experiences in, one of the things that comes to mind immediately when I think about mental health within the pediatric population is ADHD. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's been a lot that's been made uh, in the media about the increasing rates of ADHD diagnosis um, and a lot of concern for potentially like... Um, maybe over medication of our children. Mm -hmm. um, so from your point of view, from the work that you do every day, do you have any concerns at all about potentially the overdiagnosis of ADHD, over medication with especially stimulant meds, or is that sort of overblown media hype? Yeah, I think it's like there's a balance there, right? I think I thought of that word just now because I'm looking over your shoulder, June, and seeing in perfect balance. Uh -huh. uh, plug. No. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I paid him to say that. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, no, I think there, I, I think there is a little bit of a balance there between what is true with that statement, right? There is a bit of an overblown nature of it. There is a bit of an overdiagnosis nature of it. Um, but then I think it's overblown in terms of how problematic that might actually be. Uh, so, but in the work that I do, if you're asking me in terms of what I see every single day, um, you know, I think one of the challenges is uh, that we are not careful with how we're diagnosing, 
right? Where uh, it's very easy to kind of like look at something and, and just kind of say, well, that kind of just generally looks like that looks like anxiety. Mm-hmm. That's anxiety, right? Oh, that looks like, you know, oh, you feel sad a lot of the time, right? That's clearly depression, right? You have major depressive disorder. Um, and, and I think sometimes that can be the case with ADHD is, right? Oh, you have a kid who's kind of running all over the place. Um, clearly they have ADHD. Um, but so I, so to the over, you know, overdiagnosed point, yeah, I, I do think that there is some overdiagnosing. I think, though, with good, careful diagnostics, right, like in actually taking the time to kind of work through what you're seeing, what families are seeing, getting information from outside sources, um, you can come to a really good conclusion of like, this is truly, you know, this is truly ADHD that we're looking at. It's very interesting. Um, Pat, let me, let's take a step back. Sure. Um, because... You know, before I started medical school, right, and I think for people that are outside of the medical world, they kind of hear ADHD and automatically the first thing that comes to mind, at least this was a situation with me, is ADHD equals you're not able to pay attention. Hmm. However, as a psychiatry resident, having uh, spent the past several years in this space, um, my understanding of what ADHD has somehow somewhat evolved. Um, And one of the changes is that I now understand, and you're going to have to jump in and correct me if I'm That's completely okay, yeah. off. Uh, I want to hear what here. you understand, actually. This is, I want to yeah. hear this. Yeah. Let's all listen. right. All right. So my understanding is that it's not an inability to pay attention, but rather it's the misdistribution of your attention. So it's not that kid who's unable to focus on X activity. It's that kid who's asked to, I don't know, let's say he's in school. He's asked to sur- sol- solve a bunch of math questions, but he's talking about the intense game of Call of Duty from the night before. And his mind is completely elsewhere. So I kind of take that situation and I'm like, hey, like, isn't that sort of normal? Like if I had an intense game of whatever my favorite video game happens to be, you know, for that month, um, I would also be thinking about that if I was to ask to do an extremely boring task. So what would you say to um, that sort of conception of ADHD? Yeah, so first off, you nailed it in terms of uh, that mis, uh, say it again, how you said the, the, the misallocation or misdistribution, something like that. That's actually a really good way. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna geek out here for a second. Okay, mm-hmm. let's, 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 uh, let's talk science here, right? And I'm gonna not get into the, all the nitty gritty, I promise you. So what, what does it take to pay attention? Do you guys know what it takes to pay attention? Like oh, what man. parts of your brains are actually working? I what guess are, I would guess the prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal and, cortex. And I know, at least if we're giving like a stimulant, I always theorize how it's like a, not the correct amount of dopamine in the brain in the right section of the brain. I okay. guess is okay. my okay. shot okay. in the dark there. No, you're good. You're good. You're good. Yeah, yeah. Any other? Any I other agree con- with that prefrontal cortex. Yeah, prefrontal cortex is, is definitely one of the main players. And we're going to come mm-hmm. back to that in a second. So there's two other major parts of your brain, though, that are uh, big drivers in terms of focus and attention, right? Mm-hmm. So there's, uh, and I'm not going to, I'm not a neurologist, so I'm not, let's not get into the, the, the smaller areas. But, you know, in within your parietal lobe, right, there's a portion of your brain that is, uh, very focused on like detail driven information, right? Mm-hmm. So we're sitting in this room right now, right? And I can look around this room and I can see like the cover of that book has a purple color in it and there's a surfboard with yellow and and uh, yellow and, and red and it's it's very long and reaches almost to the ceiling mm-hmm. and this light has like kind of a, a whitish blue glow to it and your phone case is, is, is red, right? All these details, right? That's something that your parietal lobe is like pulling in information for, right? Mm-hmm. And I can see that your shirt is gray, but you are also kind of like, like facing towards me, right? And uh, the color of your eyes, right? And the color of your shirt. And then there's your temporal lobe. Right. And your temporal lobe, what that's doing is it's pulling in time and spatial and movement relation type things. Right. So, um, you know, if I, uh, you know, you are sitting, you know, like three or four feet away from me on each side. Right. And, you know, the the distance from me to the door versus you to the door and, uh, you know, the fact that uh, you know, you guys are, you know, how close you guys are to each other, right? All these kind of different pieces of information. For people who have ADHD, right? All that information, you, you, me, all of us, that information is coming in, right? Mm-hmm. And our brain's got to do something with it. Because if I am focusing on the color of your plants back there, well, listening to the sound of your voice. And I didn't mention sound, right? Mm-hmm. All the sounds, right? If I'm focusing on the color of your plants versus the sound of your voice as you're talking to me, 
I'm misallocating where my focus and attention is going to. I'm focused. I'm attentive. I'm focused and attentive to the wrong thing, mm -hmm. right? If if I'm driving a car, let's say, and I'm focused and attentive to the guy riding the bike on the bike path next to me, but I'm not paying attention to the speed and the and the and the distance uh, speed at which I'm approaching and the distance between me and the car stopped at the red light in front of me. I'm paying attention, but I'm not allocating that attention appropriately. And so this is where people with ADHD tend to have problems because they're not allocating their attention uh, where they're putting their attention towards. Prefrontal cortex you mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. Come back to that. Yes, you're absolutely right. That's the center of where all this is going to get processed, right? It's going to take, it's going to say, there's noise over here that is the color of your shirt, but that's irrelevant because what's important are the words that are coming out of this person's mouth. Hey, that person's got a body, they're facing you, they're looking at you, right? Mm -hmm. They look like they want to hear what you're saying or they look like they want to get your attention, right? Their eyes got big, they open their mouth, mouth mm -hmm. a little bit, right? They're trying to get your attention for something. They're trying to chime in. I'm looking over here at the glass case, right? That's where your prefrontal cortex comes in and says, glass case, irrelevant, colored plants, irrelevant. Look at these two guys over here. Look at that car right in front of you that you're approaching very quickly. Look, don't worry about the bike guy, you know, going by. This test that's sitting in front of you, there's questions on it. These are the things you need to focus on, not what's happening outside that window of the classroom right mm -hmm. now. What we have seen in kids who have ADHD and adults who have ADHD too, but I uh, speak more to kids is, you know, and, and, you know, the data on this is always kind of, you know, as limited as it can be. Right. And these are, yeah, but, uh, you know, what we've seen is like the prefrontal cortex in these kids does not function on the same level as that of, you know, uh, kids who don't have ADHD, right. They're not having the same, uh, benefit and what, what helps. So when we talk about medicines being stimulants, mm -hmm. right? Well, what are they stimulating? What are they stimulating? They're stimulating your prefrontal cortex to kind of turn on, mm -hmm. right? So now they're on, now they're focused and it's just like, oh, I don't care about that guy walking down the street. I don't care about the color of your shirt. I care about what you're saying. I care about what you're doing right now. The body language you're giving me, the, the focus and attentiveness you're giving me right now. So that's how I always explain like what ADHD is. And I got way off on a tangent there, I think, but I hope no, I, 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 I somehow yeah, got yeah. to your question. Yeah, that was very educational. And um, when you're talking about the prefrontal cortex, I mean, Obviously, you know, it has to be functioning properly for you to have that executive decision making mm -hmm. to focus on the things that you need to be focusing on. Right. So, um, Pat, we know that especially when we're looking at uh, children and their development uh, trajectories, uh, boys, especially when we're talking about the prefrontal cortex, it, they lack they lag about two years behind. Um, when you compare it to the yeah. development of girls. Sure. So I think you know where I'm about to go with this. I'll well, say it anyway. <laughs> yeah. So we, we discussed um, before we started recording. Yeah. It was a new article in the Psychiatric, like APA, one of the APA magazines that yeah. was pushed out. That we all read like three times over. We exactly. all read it three times yeah. over. Yeah, 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 Psychiatric, exactly. Psychiatric, Psychiatric Times. Time. Shout go out. Go get your copy today. <laughs> <laughs> it's invigorating. Yeah. Right. So it mentioned that boys actually are diagnosed with ADHD about twice as often as girls. Um, in fact, I have here, the prevalence rate in young boys is about 13%, uh, whereas in young girls is about half of that. Do you think some of that has to do with the lack of prefrontal cortex development um, that we see proportional to females when we look at them at the same stage of development? That's a really great question that I'm not going to be able to answer. Like, I just mm -hmm. don't know the answer, unfortunately. And if I was like, say, like to make guesses, right. And I were to say like, oh, maybe if I were guessing at anything, I'd say, well, probably what we're looking at is just a typical developing boy who people are just misalloc misallocating, right. Use that word again, misallocating a diagnosis that's convenient to. Right. Misalloc you know, saying like, oh, look how hyper they are. Look how, you know, look how they're not making good decisions, uh, not good decisions, but like making uh, good executive decision making mm -hmm. uh, versus their female counterparts. Yeah. I mean, truthfully, I think if I were to. And I don't know what that article said, by the way, because we as we said, we read it three times. But, mm -hmm. you know, uh, no, I mean, I haven't had a chance to read it myself yet, um, but, you know, what I tend to see and experience is that 
uh, I think people attribute certain gender expectations um, to boys, certain gender expectations to girls. And I think, you know, sometimes there's uh, things, you know, we, we, we want to see a pattern. We want to see something fit a mold we're used to. And I think sometimes what happens is, is girls, um, girls get missed. Mm. Girls get missed more often in the diagnosis than boys get. Um, I think, um, you know, I mean, I, I think I could go both ways on what I just said, but, you know, like, I, I think, you know, sometimes the, like, how could the quiet girl, right? The, how could the quiet girl who's not running all over and playing sports, right? How could they have ADHD? How could they have ADHD? Um, and I think that's wrong that we do that. I'll be honest, you know, in, in my, so I've been, uh, with virtue of at a castle for almost six years now. And in that time, um, I have never seen a gender difference associated with girls versus boys for ADHD or okay. for ADHD specifically. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for, thanks for asking. Uh, thanks for clarifying rather. Uh, yeah, I've never really seen the difference now. Look, I mean, uh, I'm a, I'm a guy who works in a community health center, right? right? Like my experience is what my experience, my patient population is very biased in terms of this is what I see. But, uh, and so, you know, if you take the larger pool of information and look at it, maybe it says what I see is not correct. But I, I would generally say that I, I feel that the girls that I see are probably missed mm -hmm. more than they're actually diagnosed uh, and versus the boys who I think get, you know, people are, are easy to diagnose them. You know, they, 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 right. they, 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 they're, they're more willing to diagnose it. And I don't know if I've expressed that quite eloquently, but it's, it's still what I mean. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it makes total sense. Like, I feel like when we all think of that stereotypical young ADHD male, right. we can all picture that in our heads, like running around just like yeah. crazy and, and, you know, intense. Um, and, and that girl, like you're saying is kind of, it manifests perhaps in a different way. Maybe it's because their prefrontal cortex is growing at a faster rate at that age when they're young. What, what confuses me the most about ADHD is, you know, your neurobiological explanation I thought was super badass. You know, who, who we're trying to make this content for is people who work in the mental health industry. So I think that they're really gonna appreciate that. But so ADHD is broken down into like inattentive type and hyperactive type. Mm -hmm. And this is where I get really confused because in my opinion, um, you know, little personal tangent here. So I forget if I told you, I live with bipolar disorder. You um, did tell me that. Oh, okay. uh, yes. I mean, it's, it's what we talk about when you go. Yeah. 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 The yeah. first thing I say, nice try, <laughs> by the way. Yeah, yeah. So Let me drop this nugget on you. Uh, right. Right. Uh, <laughs> but so, um, you know, my mother who wrote this, uh, or yeah. excuse me, illustrated this badass uh, book, um, and she won't mind me saying this. She's kind of a little hippie in nature, right? And so me growing up, I was, I feel, one of these hyperactive ADHD. Now, maybe mm -hmm. I could focus pretty well, um, but definitely hyperactive. I just had so much energy. I think getting me involved with sports was a wonderful outlet because I could burn off some of that energy. But I probably think I met at least some of the criteria for ADHD. Right. Now, though, sitting in my seat as a 34 year old man who's in his third year of psychiatric residency, I really think about how maybe that um, although I met the criteria for hyperactive type of ADHD, maybe it was really a prodromal of my bipolar disease yeah. or maybe a prodromal of, you know, generalized anxiety disorder has a lot of restlessness sensations. So I think a lot about like if I got put on a stimulant when I was young, wouldn't that really potentially make my either anxiety or bipolar features worse? And how do we control for that? That is an incredibly tough question to answer. So, um, so first of all, I mean, like, you know, when I talk to families, when I talk to, you know, kids about, you know, when I'm trying to figure out what's going on with them, you know, first thing you just, and just to illustrate the point you made is like the Venn diagram of mental health illnesses is the overlap is incredible, right? The, you know, 
there is a central point somewhere in there where all of these worlds kind of come together mm -hmm. and combined. And it's like, well, what is that? Right. When you talk about like, you know, uh, difficulty with sleep, let's just use that as an example. Right. Well, we could talk about bipolar disorder. We could talk about uh, major depressive disorder. We could talk about soft symptoms, not not diagnostic criteria for things like autism spectrum disorder and ADHD. Right. Like these things that just kind of constantly are there. Agitation, right? It's extreme irritability, right? Well, diagnostic criteria for an adolescent with depression, certainly a criteria for bipolar disorder, right? But these kids who, uh, you know, also have DMDD and, you know, it's just like, it's never ending. People will talk about anxiety and irritability, right? I and mean, again, like kind of a more soft criteria, not diagnostic criteria, mm -hmm. things that are associated with. And so it's really, really hard at early points in time sometimes to kind of come back and say, like, clearly you were ADHD or clearly you had bipolar disorder or whatever else might be going on there. But to your actual question of, OK, what if we did this and we made something worse? Mm -hmm. right? What if I gave you a medication and it exacerbated the problem that really was there? OK. It's a problem they always have to live with. Like it's a decision I'm always kind of debating and always mm -hmm. have to live with. Um, I also ask another question though, which is what if I'm right and I don't do anything? Mm -hmm. And what is the implication and the, the downside to that? And let's not talk about ADHD for a second. We can look at anything, but if you talked about like an anxiety disorder, right? Well, what if I were to say, like, look, let's not treat that with medicine, assuming it, assuming this is pretty severe, right? Let's right. not treat that with medicine, right? You have a, a 10 year old with severe anxiety disorder. We're not going to treat them with a medication to help them with that. And what does that look like at 20, right? And the reality is, is it doesn't look very good, mm -hmm. right? Likely. And like, we're, and I'm making some assumptions that like this person is getting care, they're getting treatment and it's not working on the level we would want it to. Medication's the next step. We choose not to do it. It generally is not going to look very good. So come back to like, I'm making a decision. Yeah, this kid, I've had this happen a lot of times where I have a child who that could be autism. Mm -hmm. Like I could be looking at autism right now, but I just like something is telling me this is ADHD more than anything. I'm going to try a stimulant for this kid. You really, I mean, the, at the end of the, uh, sorry, got a little, uh, got a little sidetracked in my brain there. I'm going to try a stimulant for this kid. If I'm right, things are going to get better, right? I'm going to see the difference very clearly. If I'm wrong, I'm going to see the difference very clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, now that might, Take a little bit longer to be obvious. Oh, well, maybe they're just not on high enough a dose, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so we increase the dose a little bit. But the reality is, is that I think we're going to tell those problems pretty quickly on and identify, hey, we are not moving in the right track with this care. And so we're going to reverse course. So in that kid and, and in the rare situation, but not impossible situation that I have a kid who is kind of prodromal, like you talked mm -hmm. about for having bipolar disorder. And I am convinced that this is ADHD and I treat them for their ADHD. I'm likely going to notice that early on. And I've had it happen where I notice it early on and it's a very clear path to fixing it mm -hmm. and it's to reverse course and to reevaluate the situation but i think that's just as a good doctor right you just have to be willing to be wrong right you right. have to be willing and and not just you have to be willing to be wrong but you have to be willing to educate your families that you're working with your patients that you're working with mm -hmm. i use the word families a lot instead of patients sorry um educate them on look i could be wrong mm -hmm. <laughs> right I, I i just i might get this you know, I might be off the mark on this and we might find out that we have a harder road ahead of us than I'm kind of claiming we we should have. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the way I look at it is like, what would happen if I didn't treat? Mm -hmm. And what is the worst case scenario if I do treat? Now, if you're talking and I think if I'm talking too much, you guys just cut in. Oh, never. You guys cut in. Um, if I'm talking, if you're talking about like, 
let's say I'm on a stimulant for the next 15 years, mm -hmm. right? What's the impact of that on my bipolar disorder? Mm -hmm. So from a practicality standpoint, I'm going to say you made it 15 years on a stimulant. Right. <laughs> Nobody makes it 15 years on a stimulant. Most people, most kids who take stimulants, they're done. They, they like, they're so non-compliant by the time they get to their adolescence, right? Like it'd be amazing mm -hmm. if you made it that long taking mm -hmm. it. But if you had bipolar disorder, I'm sorry, I'm not talking about you specifically, a mm -hmm. person. If that person has bipolar disorder and they were on a stimulant for that long and they made it without having severe problems associated, that's incredible, right? right? Like that, that's impressive. Most of the time, these problems start to show themselves mm -hmm. early on, right? The, 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 those other kind of core symptoms start to present themselves a bit a bit early on and you recognize as a, as a clinician, you're recognizing that and you're kind of saying, Oh, oh okay. You know, I need to, I need to make, I need to make some changes with this person. I need to make sure they're well educated on what's going on with them. Right. Um, right. And it kind of sounds like you're advising us, like be very upfront with our patients. Like, Hey, look, like this is what I think is going to help the problem, but I might get this wrong. I very well could make the problems worse. And if, if I do, you gotta let me know as soon as possible. I feel more comfortable having that conversation about SSRIs, yeah, because um, I have very limited experience with stimulants, but I definitely will apply that to my future patients. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think that rule applies to whether you are a hospitalist, yeah, <laughs> whether you're a family medicine doctor or a surgeon, right? Hopefully you're not the wrong that often as a surgeon. Right, right. <laughs> we got in there, yeah. Turns out I left my scalpel. <laughs> my bad. Turns, yeah. yeah. Turns out it was your right leg, not your left leg. Right. Uh, that was the problem. Um, no, but I mean, you know, it's important to make sure everybody knows, you know, we're human beings. Mm -hmm. Like, and especially in psychiatry and mental health, we don't have the same uh, diagnostic tools at our disposal that our colleagues have in medicine, right? Like a blood pressure cuff gives you an answer, mm -hmm. right? Like a blood pressure cuff tells you consistently at most every single time what's going on with that patient. You know, we like to say we have scales, right? And we like to say we have these measurement tools that tell us something, but like they're very operator error dependent sometimes, right? Oh, how did that person answer that question? Were they in a good mood? Were they in a bad mood? Were they psychotic? Were they not psychotic? Were, you know, were they being honest with us versus, you know, they were trying to hide something? Um, you know, we, we unfortunately are kind of at the, the mercy of a bit more um, subjective, uh, you know, ways of measuring and way of diagnosing our, our, our patients. And we don't have the privilege of what, what I have the privilege of uh, as a, as in doing my job is I get kids that come to me for five days a week, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of going, you know, uh, they come to see me, uh, they're in our program. I have multiple people who have eyes on these, uh, on these children and they are able to tell me everything that's going on with them on a day by day basis, right? I get to tell families like, it's not just what I saw this hour, it's what I saw for the last 30 mm -hmm. hours this week, right? Uh, but most of us are in a position where we see like you want some mom. Right, right, right. Yeah, and that certainly I'm sure complicates and makes a lot harder the actual diagnostic process. And you kind of touched upon, you know, this, the importance of being able to identify, which to me really boils down to your ability to conduct that interview, your clinical, you know, your clinical knowledge. Um, so, and, and we also mentioned that, you know, especially ADHD, like symptoms of irritability, um, like these things can be, there's a lot of overlap with a lot of other psychiatric disorders. Yeah. So when you have all these factors that are complicating and kind of obscuring, is this true ADHD or not? Like, how do you approach that, especially when you have younger kids? Because I came across a stat, it said, and I want to pose this question to you, Logan, um, because I don't think it's fair if I ask Pat, but here's a little trivia. Uh, what do you oh. think? <laughs> I think you would just get it immediately. <laughs> what do you think is the lowest, what do you think is the youngest age required for an ADHD diagnosis? Oh, um, I guess I'm going to go with six. All right. So the answer that I have, at least according to my research, and Pat, you can just correct me if I'm wrong. Earliest age for ADHD is four years yep. old. Oh, wow. Four yeah. years. Okay. Um, and in fact, it says the median age for diagnosis of severe ADHD is in fact four years old. 
Hmm. So I look at that and I'm just like, what in the world? Like, I imagine a four year old kid, and of course they're going to be distractible. Of course they might have right. bouts of irritability, of anger, yeah. and all these symptoms that we commonly associate with ADHD. So what am I missing here, Pat? What What is this patient that's four years old that's getting diagnosed with severe ADHD actually look like in clinical practice? That is a really great question. You guys are both welcome anytime you want to come over to the CASEL program mm -hmm. where we have three and four year olds uh, who are in our program in our therapeutic nursery. And you can get to see what some of this, this looks like. Um, so um, yeah, so I think one important thing you always wanna keep in mind is what's typical and normal development. Right. Like it's the point you're making. Like you think of the three and the four year old running around, uh, you know, climbing on top of things, right? All that kind of stuff. I'll give you a somewhat of a funny analogy. And this was uh, something a pediatrician said to me one time. Uh, I have I have uh, I have three standards of what is what a, if a kid has ADHD or not. There is the kid who's in my waiting room who the family thinks has ADHD and is not moving. There is the kid, but just staring at the fish tank in the lobby. There is the kid who's up at the glass of the fish tank, knocking on it, mm -hmm. banging on it, trying to get the fish's attention and maybe wiggling their hand in the top, right? Those kids, I feel pretty good that I'm probably going to agree with the family on the first one. I'm going to say, you got to go see psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And then there's the kid who's in the fish tank. Oh, okay. <laughs> Right. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> Those kids I don't even bring back to the room. I just I just write the script right there. <laughs> um, you know, uh, there are definitely norms, though, right? There's curiosity. Mm -hmm. There's emotional distress, like poor emotional distress uh, tolerance. There, uh, there are kids who. You know, they just like everything in their world is exciting as it should be, and that's healthy, and that's normal. Um, one of the big challenges I would say, I'm going to, I'll come back around to this. I promise. One of the big challenges too, and that I face is that I work with a lot of kids, um, who, uh, unfortunately have been like the victims of, of some form of trauma in their mm -hmm. life. And when I say victims of trauma, I, I don't just mean like physical violence, sexual violence, but like housing insecurities, financial insecurities of the families, um, having uh, family members who are incarcerated, all that kind of yeah. stuff, right? And so this has a made that trauma has a major impact on their ability to regulate uh, themselves in their own lives. And so that can cause a bit of a difficulty, right? Because uh, even just neglect, right? If nobody has ever taught you or demonstrated to you or even just allowed you to self-soothe, right? You, you, you will lack that ability and it's hard to then regulate yourself when things are exciting, right? I go from calm and cooperative to big and explosive because I don't know the difference between that. So there is a, a lot to kind of weed through there. Am I looking at somebody who has lacked the external developmental factors, the things that should have helped them get to this point, or have they been exposed to things that kind of held them back versus I have somebody who know legitimately like this is, this is above and beyond what I would expect for typical development. So what do these kids look like? Truthfully, what I experience um, most of the time with these kids, these four year olds, uh, as you're saying, are um, <laughs> going back to the fish tank example, right? These, these are kids who I am in my room, I am um, uh, doing an evaluation and they are literally using the chairs in the office as long jump implements. Like they mm -hmm. are doing backflips off of, you know, imagine, I want you to just, first off, picture a four-year-old jumping, just mm -hmm. jumping. Now picture them trying to do a backflip, right? right? Like developmentally, this is not something they are equipped to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yet they are just all over the place. This is the kid who, you know, over the course of an evaluation, um, is joyfully, joyfully kind of ransacking uh, the office. And just mm -hmm. to be clear, when I'm in there and it's happening, I just let it happen. Right. Because this is my, like, this is a, a piece of evidence that I need 
to help make this decision, right? Let them go. As long as they're not hurting themselves, they're not hurting you, they're not hurting anybody, let's let that happen. Because I will then be able to come back to you confidently as a parent and say, I know what you're seeing. I know what you're dealing with. Um, and again, you want to also be able to compare that to other children who are, you know, for all intensive purposes, your norms, right? You want to be able to look at a kid who can get excited, right? Get excited, but then be able to have an appropriate level of excitement in relation to a certain stimuli, right? Um, you want to see a kid who is able to, uh, you know, come up and then appropriately come back down, right? You want to see the kid who can take a level of redirection, right? So, um, you know, if if you do something that I, you know, has to, you know, uh, I'm trying to uh, think of the right word here. I need you to sit in your seat. Right. Let's use that as an example, right? I need you to sit in your seat, right? If you have a kid who's like, they sit back in their seat, but then they're back up. Like they sat, but they stood back up. No, no, no. Let's come back to your seat. Oh, okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Back up again. Oh, I just mm -hmm. messed the mic up. Uh, you know, they they they're con they cannot take that redirection and they're just kind of oblivious to what the fact that redirection was given in any sort. Um, those are kids. That's another big thing that I com commonly will see with these four year olds uh, is that they just lack that ability to kind of uh, take any sort of redirection. They are touch. It's like this need to. It's not just I'm curious and I'm interested. It's I'm curious and I'm interested. Right? Let's make uh, let's make something loud. Let's make something explosive. Mm -hmm. Very sensory seeking. Very sensory seeking is what I experience. Um, so what does a patient like that look like after you give them the appropriate treatment? Say you put them on a stimulant medication. Um, one, what is the rate of success? Like do a vast majority of patients like that Im um, improve after treatment? And what is improvement from that kind of a severe version of ADHD look like? Yeah. So, um, I mean, one thing to also consider is that when you're talking about young kids, um, you are a bit more uh, conservative in your treatment, right? For, for a number of reasons, everything from let me make sure this is not typical human development, mm -hmm. right? Let me make sure I just didn't have a bad day and observing mm -hmm. the kid. Um, uh, two, you want to see if they are capable of, you know, accepting kind of interventions to build structure and build modification to how they engage and how they react. And then, you know, the other thing is, you know, stimulants don't come without their consequences, right? Appetite and sleep are the biggest things we talk about. Cardiac risks are real, but mm -hmm. a much a much smaller kind of concern, uh, or much smaller likelihood, I should say. Bigger concern, smaller likelihood. Right. Um, and so we have other options too. We can use non-stimulants. Uh, I think most commonly people will use something like uh, clonidine, um, which has efficacy in terms of treatment of ADHD as well. Um, and especially for like younger kids. Um, but, you know, to your point, if I were to treat somebody, right, what does that turn into? So the first thing I always say to parents is my goal here is not to make your child non-reactive, non-responsive mm -hmm. and acting like yeah. a zombie, which is the word they all right. use. They mm -hmm. all use. And I empathize with that 100%. Um, I say what I need you to do is be mindful of what you're seeing right now in front of you. Look at the child that we're not giving treatment to at this point. What do they look like? What are they doing? And then I want you to keep that in mind when you're concerned about what you're seeing with the medicine. Mm. Because if this works, they are going to be much calmer. And they are going to be much calmer. But I'm not going for not doing anything. I'm going from calm. The calmer I'm looking for is spending 15 minutes coloring. The calmer I'm looking for is putting a Lego set together, as best as a four-year-old can put a Lego set together. The, you know what? Four-year-olds can probably put a Lego set together better right. than I can put a Lego set <laughs> right. together. Let's be honest. These four-year-olds these days, you know. I mean, yeah, they, yeah. Can, they, they, they know how to, like, they can get, like, <laughs> they could probably uh, put a firewall on my uh, on my laptop, right. uh, let alone uh, uh, put a Lego set together. But, um, you know, uh, I just said firewall and laptop, like I know what the hell I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, I'm looking for the kid who can get on task, complete things, enjoy life, sit and watch a movie with you, right? Well, think about what watching a movie was like with your kid, 
Mm -hmm. Did you ever do it? No, I never did it. They were jumping all over the couch and they couldn't sit still. And I was, I never got to enjoy anything. Can you enjoy a movie now? Right. That's the kid I'm looking for. If you see anything other than that, we've gone the wrong direction and we've caused a problem before we've caused this, we've found a solution. So we're going to reverse course. But generally speaking, that's what we see. I mean, I, I truthfully, you know, I've treated in that age group, I, I have treated, I've become very comfortable and I've treated kids uh, that age with stimulant medications even, uh, mostly actually with stimulants versus like something like Clonidine. I have treated, um, God, I mean, it's, I don't know if I would say hundreds, but I've treated a lot of kids I've, mm -hmm. just in my time and the amount of time and the, the fact that I get to see these kids, I get to see, I get to treat them a lot. Um, and I would say I've seen hundreds of kids. I don't think I've treated hundreds of kids. Let me back that up there. Um, but I've treated a lot of them and I get kids who could not stay in preschool, right? Oh, they wow. were getting expelled from preschools, which. Wow. Yeah. That's like an uh, accomplishment in some ways. Yeah, no, not in a good way. I guess, not in a good way, but yeah. it's it's still like I mean, and truthfully, I've I've had kids who have been expelled from three preschools. Wow. Wow. Yeah, and 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 so now that's my that's my 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 benchmark, right? Like that's the thing I'm trying to move away. Benchmark, whatever the the thing I'm trying to move away from. And I get these kids to, we, 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 I, I should say we, cause I work with the team and we get these kids to a point that they are, you know, they're able to like now actually do ABC worksheets, right? They're mm -hmm. able to, you know, have a, a craft in front of them that requires cutting and gluing. And, you know, while these things to you and me might seem like, oh, yeah, great for a three-year-old, for a four-year-old, this is like. Like how, like they never could do this. They right. never could do this. Um, it's a pretty big task. And so that's the thing I'm trying to shoot for is I want to get them to a point that they are at their most likely to be successful in those education settings that best serve them. So, but the, and that's typically what we see. We see these kids kind of come around. It's not hundred percent, right? We have kids that I, 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 and, and, and I will say oftentimes when, when it doesn't go well, when it doesn't go well, um, it's often because we miss something in the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. uh, we miss something in the history. And, you know, uh, I can tell you like probably, you know, I, I mean, I can even say in the past, in the past three months, I've had at least two or three, right. Who we went the ADHD route and then with, they went poorly. And then with further history taking, right we learned things that were more in the trauma realm and it became very clear and obvious like well that's that's why this didn't go well right that's that's yeah. you know and it's not that stimulants and trauma it's not that that's like bad don't do it right, right. it's just that we were treating something that didn't exist we were treating I something see. that didn't exist okay um and so when we kind of reverse course refocused our goals got the appropriate resources in order we started to have better outcomes right and it's a long road if you're talking about trauma related things but uh it's we got better outcomes right right so you know we've been chatting here for about 45 minutes so we have about 15 minutes left or so so perhaps we kind of stick to adhd ish yeah. this episode but i'm very curious i have, I have kind of two questions um uh, before because i want to see how adhd I talk too much that's, see, that's <laughs> no, really the problem so you're in the you're right field there. you're the right field you're talking to two to your colleagues here right <laughs> um chatty kathy's that's why we're doing a, a podcast <laughs> in our free time isn't it yeah, yeah. um <laughs> you know none of us are earning money on this yet um so so my first question um, I earned twenty dollars on TikTok. Ooh, oh, twenty dollars! Wow, look at that. We have a lot to aspire yeah, to. We'll 20, put that to you, our loans. Yes, right? you know that's we only right. have four hundred thousand dollars a piece. But um, <laughs> okay, so before we get how to social media impacts ADHD, I'm very curious. You know, when I was eleven years old, um, and I imagine you too, June. One of the most important things to you was, at least to me, was sports, and, like doing stuff. And like, so how does helping a, a child with ADHD impact their performance in sports? I'm just gonna ask you to clarify the question there for a second. Um, are you asking in terms of like from a, they were struggling 
because of their ADHD and now they can be on target and on task? Or are you talking about like from a performance enhancement standpoint? Like I'm not as sure. As an adult, like more so with adults, I would say. You know, I guess I'm not really sure. I, you know, this on my a quick plug for my other podcast, Talk <laughs> Mental Health with Dr. Logan Noon, like the fourth <laughs> or fifth episode I had on one of my great friends um, who's now a, a pediatrician out in California. Uh -huh. um, and this guy's a, a super cool dude. He was a collegiate football player. Uh -huh. And so he used to always talk about like when he um, was treated for his ADHD as a child, suddenly he was able to like actually follow the plays of the football coach with much more intensity. Like he was of course a very athletic dude, but now he could finally apply some of his athleticism in a more uh, knowledgeable way. Yeah. So I think that that, again, let's go back to what it takes to focus and concentrate, right? And if all of that stimuli are coming into your mind, but you are incapable of filtering what's the most important, right? You cannot follow, okay, so-and-so has got to make three, you know, three strides up and then cut across and I got to make sure I'm timing, you know, like, all that stuff. So they're going to set a pick. I got to be ready for the pass. You know, all that kind of stuff. They're setting a block. If you're just like in la la land for mm -hmm. all intents and purposes, but let, let if you are just so focused on, you know, that last play, go at that game of Call of Duty, right? If, even if you're just focused on like oh, that catch, man, woo, mm -hmm. right? Like one handed and coach is going over the next play. Mm -hmm. What good are you? Right. Right. You are you are not any help in this right now. And with a lot of kids who have ADHD, they definitely struggle with that. Um, you know, now I will say, like, you know, I have a lot of uh, kids. I have a lot of football players, mm -hmm. uh, young football players like uh, what's it, like Pop Warner. I never played football, but like that mm -hmm. youngest age group that's playing football. Right. Big and uh, big amongst Camden families. And um you know, the, a lot of them will talk about just, you know, the benefit of the playing sports, the playing football and how great the coach is with them and how they're able to kind of keep them together because of the structure, I think, that sports offers to a lot of kids. Um, you know, the ex, you know, in order to run a practice, you have to have a lot of structure. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of what, what kids with ADHD are not very good at dictating for themselves but thrive from when it is dictated for them is, is good structure, is good structure. And, uh, but, you know, so a lot of, a lot of families will talk to me about like how just helpful it is when they're at the football, you know, football uh, practice or the game. But in terms of that enhancement, their ability to focus, ability to pay attention, there is definitely, definitely, I mean, it's, it, this isn't just because we're, you know, we think of focus and attention with academics, mm -hmm. right? That's where we go to when we think of like, oh, how well can I focus? How well can I be attentive? But the reality is, is that it's pervasive in our lives, right? And we have to be focused and attentive while we're doing this podcast. And we have to be focused and attentive while we're driving home. And we have to be focused and attentive when we're on the playing field mm -hmm. and even knowing it's time to get out on the field, right? I mean, how, I mean, you know, how many kids it's like, all right, offense out there. And then there's three kids sitting on the bench because they're mm -hmm. like playing in the grass, right? Again, normal, typical, healthy development for a lot of kids. You know, like I, I think of my kids when they were in T-ball and like they were more interested in the dirt than they were in the, actually what was happening in the right. game, uh, building little sand castles. Oh, look at the ants. Uh, but, um, you know, it definitely, if you can take a kid who is just, unable to sit to focus unable to know what is happening in the game in the practice and then you get them kind of focused with you know treatment of their ADHD they can have I mean it can be an amazing turnaround of how effective it can be now as far as like if you were to like measure that in some way I don't know the answers right. to that but mm -hmm. you know I definitely hear from people about how effective it can be well we're just about at the final stretch of this interview here um and one of the things that I really want your input on is, you know, Pat, when we talk about, you know, you, you just talked a lot about attention and in, in certain ways, attention is a type of currency in our society today, right? When we, <laughs> of course, yeah. When we talk, segue. Yeah, segue. You know exactly where good I'm going with segue. this one. He's a professional. <laughs> He's a professional. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when we think about attention as a currency, right, mm -hmm. there's all these external forces that are trying to purchase that currency, right? And right. especially, I mean, 
it's no secret that the main culprit are going to be the social media companies, yeah. right? Facebook, TikTok, um, Instagram, like all these programs were designed to capture your attention. And when we say capture your attention, it means to take away attention from the other stuff that's going on in your life. Yeah. In fact, one can argue that this may be causing um, this this uh, increase in ADHD, the symptoms of ADHD at least. Um, so what do you think, like how do you think social media actually influences um, the rate of ADHD diagnosis? And in particular, um, I'm gonna throw out a timeline to you around 2010, that's when social media use really became ubiquitous for our mm. youth. Um, you're not, you, essentially after 2010, you couldn't maintain a social life without being on some of these uh, sure. yeah, social media platforms, especially when, when it comes to the youngest of our population. Yeah. Um, so given that, um, you know, within the past 15 years, um, this new technology has become so pervasive and it's, it's in captured the minds of so many young Americans, um, and it's not surprising because they were designed to do exactly that. Yeah. And these social media companies, I mean, they have immense amount of power, influence, immense amount of uh, resources to kind of dedicate all their research and development to this end of capturing attention. Right. Have you seen a correlation? I mean, I saw you do this, so I'm assuming yes. No, no. What, no. what kind I, of correlation did you see? Anticipating where you were going. Okay. I was anticipating all right. more ADHD yeah. cases with that. Have, that you, have you actually seen increased ADHD? Like, how often do you talk to your ADHD patients about social media? media use yeah okay that's a good question so i mean it it, it does come up um you know in the nature of being a, a a psychiatrist who's like in my position as like a director of a program um you know talk about allocation of resources right like i mean i get allocated to certain aspects of the job um that don't necessarily afford me the time to kind of dive into that nitty gritty something. So like, I don't want to sit here and say, like, oh my God, I talk to my patients about social media all the time. <laughs> like I, 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 I truthfully do, do not do that. I will talk intermittently about it when it's like clinically appropriate about things that they're doing that are like unsafe on social media. And mm -hmm. then, you know, again, as young people, we all do stupid and unsafe things, but it's a matter of, you know, the fact that, when I was growing up, it was amongst three people and they were the only people who knew and they still are the only people who know to this day. Uh. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, in this day and age, it's everybody in the world knows if you did something stupid. Um, I So I don't know that I would say ADHD has led to, I'm sorry, uh, social media use has led to a rise in ADHD. Uh, I, I If that information's out there and it might be, I just, I have never seen it or, or read about it. What there definitely is a rise in with social media though, is uh, we can see very clear correlations with depressive disorders amongst mm -hmm. adolescents and down to how much time they're spending on social media. Um, and so if you were to take a guess, uh, how much it, the rate of depression starts to drastically rise once you cross a, a threshold in terms of how much time you spend on social media a day. Any guesses? Two hours. Boom. You read that article too, mm -hmm. didn't you? I read it in a book. <laughs> I mean, yes, I totally read the article. <laughs> yeah. I read it in a book. Right in a, yeah. So no, but it's, it's two hours. Exactly. Um, and the average teenager <laughs> uh, definitely is spending far more than two hours. Here's a fun experiment. Let's take out our phones. Do you guys have uh -oh. your... Uh, well, I know where this I is can't. going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Mine is recording. Phones are there. All right, yeah. I'll be the victim. Wait, I'll be the victim. Uh, I'll be the victim here. And I'll look at what my uh, my daily... What is it? My, my screen, screen, screen time. 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 Yeah. I know what you're trying to get after. Yeah, 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 yeah. screen time. I know it's in here somewhere. Uh, if I can find it. Uh, and I don't want to take too much time doing this. Uh, I can't, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an ex -annual. I don't know how to do this. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, I would guess that I am spending probably more than two hours a right. day on my phone, uh, looking at my screen and I'm not a teenager and teenagers were spending far more mm -hmm. than that on their phone. Um, and I definitely will say that I have seen that happen, the attention thing, right? Uh, so much of it is, is seeking, uh, is seeking attention. Uh, so much of it is like, who liked this, who didn't like this, who like, and I don't mean like said they don't like it, but just didn't comment. Right. Um, but a little bit to the ADHD, ADHD part is that, 
you know, these uh, these algorithms, right, are are built to keep you sucked in doom scrolling doom scrolling yeah. yes they're ca- so so well, what does doom scrolling actually define it just to make sure i'm on the same page i mean i just guess like staring at your phone you continuously scroll it's like what are you even truly looking what for? are you looking at yeah. yeah okay that we're on the same page there okay good 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 i just want to make sure we're on the same page yeah what are like you know just like psh, 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 i have no idea what any of this i anything i just looked at was um the um but that really like again everything's a shiny object to a kid who has ADHD, right? Again, going back to all those things, if you're not filtering out all the irrelevant information, everything's a shiny object. Well, like, you know, just that new image, new image, new image, new image, new image, right? It's just like everything's so shiny and so appealing. And even if I'm only on it for half a second, oh God, it was so, mm-hmm. so thrilling to pop the screen back up. And that that really... Um, well, I, I don't have anything to support that kids who have ADHD are more prone to that. It definitely is something that they could be more prone to based on how it works. Right. Yeah. It's, it's got to be really challenging, especially for a kid growing up today um, to try to stay below that two hour threshold. And I thought that that article that I read was very interesting as well, because um, actually Social media use, as long as you're staying below that two hour threshold, is associated with an increase in the sense of social well being. Yes. So, social media use isn't all bad. No, right. it's just how much of it are you using and for what ends are you using it for? What ends are you yeah. using it? Yeah. yeah. So, I guess it's like I'm, I'm going to kind of draw a corollary to like the concept of money, right? It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. It's not <laughs> money itself. Right, right. So, right. I guess in the same sense, it's not actually social media, it's your relationship with social media. But I guess it's more complicated because social media is trying to pull you ever so hard and right. hold on to you in that relationship and just try to consume all your attention. Absolutely. Yeah, it absolutely is. Uh, you know, it, you know, there, you know, the old adage is like too much of a good thing. Right. You, right. You know, you can have too much of a good thing. Um, you know, but one, one thing you just were, were saying is like, you know, what is the means? To, what are the ends to which you're using this kind of limited basis? And the, it's, it creates pro socialization. Um, and you know, when you, I'll take this wrap around back what you said about doom scrolling, just to make sure we're on the same page. But the other thing that comes to mind is like, so much of my feed is just negative, right. and, and even if it's I agree with the negative comments, right? Even if it's, I agree with, you know, people who are criticizing those who are, uh, you know, pe- people who are anti-trans or people who are anti-LGBTQ uh, or, and these people who are coming out and saying like, how dare they say those things about those communities? And I'm like, yeah, I totally agree with you. How dare they say that, right? But then it's the same time, just like, oh my God, this is just one hateful thing after mm. another that I'm consuming all day long. And it's the vast majority of what quickly comes across my screen because, you know, for all intents and purposes, sex sells, sex and violence right. sell, right? And it's it's really troublesome to think like, I'm an adult and I got the foresight, that, or not foresight, but I have the ability to look at that and say like, this is just not good for me, right? But like 15 year old me? Mm-hmm. 15 year old me had no ability to do that. Hey, right? Show me more. Yeah, right. show me more. Oh my God, total burn, right? Like I sound like an old man. Now. Right, right, um, right. Uh, but, um, you know, to what end though, there is so many positive things that social media can be used for. I mean, mental health TikTok as an example. And that's a community I found myself getting wrapped up in uh, early on in the pandemic and just like that community is just so amazing and so supportive and the information out there is just wildly valuable. And and talking about like on a consumer level, right? It's not therapy. It's not actually gonna get you better, but in terms of communicating, what is, you know, what do we mean when we talk about ADHD? Or what do we mean when we talk about PTSD? What do we mean when we talk about depression, right? Let's like let's talk about let's, let's talk about the symptoms. Let's talk about the the you know the the comorbidities associated with. It. Let's talk about all these things. And it's really really such a wonderful community that like provided so much provided so much support to uh, you know I think the world I'll say like during like a very troublesome time. It was it was I mean for me it was a lifesaver right in terms of just like helping me like oh my god like the people these people are like 
saying so many wonderful things. And then like from a creative standpoint, we've talked about this, mm -hmm. like from a creative standpoint, it was a great thing to get involved in and to participate in and contribute to. Um, really just like a fantastic thing. So if used appropriately, anything can be used for a good end. It's just about finding those limits, uh, you know. So I'm very curious, you know, from from your position, you're a director of, you know, that partial hospitalization program. And it seems like a lot of other things, too. It's very cool. Um, sounds cooler than it is. Right. It's a right, lot of right. meetings. Yeah, that, that, that sounds uh, like torture. But um, my so boss one, didn't hear that. Right. right, right. <laughs> so, you know, both in the adult sector and kids, it's it's pretty routine practice, I would say. I mean, almost everywhere when a patient gets admitted. Their cell phone does not go with them. Their cell phone yeah. is locked away in their, um, you know, personal belongings. Yeah. And I get it from a legality standpoint. If someone's like yes. recording other patients or, you know, treatment interventions, whatever it may be. Yeah. But, you know, it's I don't think that we can do this forever. Right. You know, it's it's I almost wonder like what the future entails and how we can incorporate teaching patients like healthy cell phone use, not even just social media, but like how we can, okay, 30 minutes a day or an hour a day, or I guess below that two hour threshold, how can we incorporate a healthy use of social media, a healthy use of your phone? So do you ever envision like in your programs that you run that policy changing to incorporate some cell phone use in a psych ward? I think that's a really, really great question. And, and, and you're, I wish you were a hundred percent right of the reason we don't do it is because of like HIPAA violations, mm -hmm. right? privacy laws and stuff like that. And that's what we'll put on paper mm -hmm. as the reason. Have you guys done your consult rotations yet? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So you've been on a medical surgical floor. Yep. Yes, sir. How many of those patients have their cell phones? Oh, all of them, it seems like. How yeah. many of them have a roommate? A lot of them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Why doesn't that rule apply to them? Interesting. It's yeah. true. Yeah. So I, I will be honest. Um, it's disparities in care. It's mm. disparities in, um, you know, it's stigma. It's it not disparities in stigma. Sorry, it is just stigma, right? Um, when you guys are you're on your console service, right? And if a patient was identified as having suicidal ideation, right? They're on the medical surgical floor, right? They come in, they're getting stabilized for unfortunately a suicide attempt. What are they wearing? Scrubs. They're wearing guess. scrubs. They're right. not wearing their own clothes. Mm -hmm. What's in the room? Nothing. Next to nothing. Absolutely yeah, yeah. nothing. Absolutely nothing. Why do we do it? Because we're trying to protect that person from harming themselves. And you know what? There's a level of which we can't do anything else but that. Mm -hmm. But if I were to say to you right now, you got to take off everything, put on these paper scrubs. You can't have any of your belongings. You can't have a phone that you use to have all your contacts, the people you, the, maybe even if it's the limited amount of people, still right. the people who are your supports, can't you can't contact them right now that easily. And you can't even watch TV because that remote control is con uh, connected to a wire that you could use mm -hmm. uh, as a ligature, right? It's like we take so much humanity away from our patients who are on a psychiatric service or be consulted for psychiatric reasons. Uh, and it's, it's really, you know, in some ways it's kind of very demeaning, uh, to them. Definitely. So I a hundred percent want to be able to say like, it makes so much sense that we treat them equally, mm -hmm. right? We treat them equally. Um, and I would love for us to be able to get to a point where we could, you know, you know, you're on a psych psychiatric ward and you are getting education on how to effectively use this thing. I mean, mm -hmm. imagine that as a group, right? For an adult, right? right. How do you effectively use this thing? Um, okay. And now everybody turn them back over, right? Because we're done for the day. We've, we've met our 30 minute quota for the day or mm -hmm. a two hour quota. We're, we're in an hour and 59 minutes. <laughs> everybody right. put them back in quickly. Um, I, I think it would be wonderful to be able to do that. Uh, I think we're a while away from it, truthfully, mm. because I mean, everything's moved so fast, you know, in, in today's world, absolutely with technology, but, and that affects how fast everything moves in other regards, not technology related. But um, I think it, you know, I, I think there's a lot of stigma about what mental health care is and what mental health care patients are. And, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I will say when I'm on a consult service and I have a patient who doesn't have their cell phone because they were here for suicidal ideation, I mean, the first thing I, I try to establish is, has this person done anything in the past 
48 hours while they're waiting for a bed that demonstrates that they're not safe? Mm -hmm. Have they done anything that demonstrates that they're not safe? Okay. So I think we can talk about giving them some resources. Now, I, I, I often will do things like say, okay, like if they just tried to harm themselves, right? And if I'm worried that maybe there are people in this world who might help them on that path, mm -hmm. right? I might say stuff, look, we're going to let you have a cell phone, but we're not going to do the visitors, right? Because I just want to make sure that you can communicate and you can talk to people, but I just want to make sure nothing is happening while you're here that I have no control over that gets you in trouble, mm -hmm. right? You know, I might say you can have the cell phone, but we're going to keep the cord outside the room. Right. You can charge it, but you just got to charge it with the nurse's station and then they can give it to you every, you know, after it's been on the charger for an hour kind of thing. So try and give a little bit of that humanity back to them. But right. uh, yeah, unfortunately, I think we're just a bit away, a bit away. That's mm. my soapbox. I'll get there off we go. Of there we go. <laughs> well, uh, we've kept you for an hour and seven minutes. This has been a badass uh, conversation. Wonderful conversation. June, do you have I any final it. questions for Dr. Cleary here? Nothing other than um, I appreciate you so much for That's coming on. That's my father, on. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate you Dr. so Pat. much for uh, taking the time out of your busy day. And uh, more importantly, thank you for everything that you do to better the mental health of our community. Yeah, well, no, I appreciate you guys. Thank you for so much for having me on. I, I, I really do enjoy doing things like this and uh, be happy to do it again with you guys. I uh, just got to call my wife and clear it with her. First right, the time. boss. The the call, call the boss. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, but no, but, and guys, uh, you know, I, I appreciate you guys coming into mental health care. You know, it's 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 not a, I, I don't think it's as glamorous and uh, sexy as some of our other uh, fields of medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of people, uh, you know, go for the flashy stuff sometimes. And it's when you meet people who are interested in mental health care and want to come into mental health care, you know, you definitely feel like these are people who are getting into it because they have a passion and they have a real respect for the field. And so I, I just appreciate you guys coming into it and, and you know, kind of, you know, keeping the field going and, and, and learning more and teaching people more like this, right? Uh, you know, so that people are aware of like what mental health care is. So thanks so much. Well, we will definitely take you up on that offer and come to you back. We we were discussing before the show, we have like so many topics to, to go over with you. So you'll definitely be a recurring guest. So thanks again. Yeah. Um, great thanks, episode guys. here and cheers. Thanks for tuning in. If you made it an hour and nine minutes, you better leave us a review or a subscription or <laughs> All the things. No, the problem so, is, is that they'll, they'll, they'll have tuned out because they're bored by my right, voice. Right, right. And I guess uh, we should put you or what? Dr. Pat Dr. Clear? Pat Psych oh, on okay. TikTok. There we go. D-R-P-A-T-P-S-Y-C-H. I haven't posted anything in two years, but there's great stuff on there from two years ago. Feel free to go look at it. Have a good laugh. Maybe criticize me. I don't know. Right, right, right. <laughs> All right, cool. There you go. See you guys in the next one.